Last night, a young woman asked a question about innocence. And it's such an important question because at a certain point in most lives, there's a recognition that innocence has been lost or a perception that innocence has been lost. And uh, what was, where innocent was, innocence was, is now a kind of cynicism or pollution or sense of hopelessness or a jaded outlook, either spiritually or worldly. And there's a remembrance of something that was pure and fresh and clean. And in remembering that, there's then a desire to somehow reclaim that or get back to that. This is quite natural because there's still the echo of it or the taste of that freshness. The only problem that I see in that, well, it's, the problem is twofold, and that is that there is some a firm belief that since the innocence is not being experienced now, the innocence is no longer here. It's somewhere else. And the other part of that is that usually where it is remembered is where it is assumed to be. So if you remember your childhood, as this young woman was speaking, as a kind of innocence, then there's a, a hope or an attempt to somehow get back to that childhood. But that's impossible. That's gone. That's over. That childhood is over. In recognizing that, then of course there's the fear, well that must mean the innocence is over since the innocence and the childhood were so linked. So the, the problem is really centered in somehow not trusting or not knowing or not experiencing that the innocence, the purity that is sought is already here at the core, at the bottom of all the experiences that have been layered on top of it. So there have been violations, there have been betrayals, there has been suffering, there has been misery, there have been sellouts, and everyone is both the victim of that and the perpetrator of that. And it's very good to see the being victimized and the victimizing but at the bottom of it all, this innocence still is. If you will give up your activity, which is mental, it may have byproducts that are physical or circumstantial or emotional, but it's mental activity to return to some time in your life when you knew yourself to be innocent and pure powerful and free and good and holy and one with God. If you will give up the image of that, if you give up the attempt to get that back, if you will actually burn in the huge fire of disillusionment that is the experience of the loss of that, rather than trying to get it back, and most spirituality is really about trying to get it back. And if you put your mind into a trance by some of the most beautiful methods, it can work for a moment or two or an hour or the period of a retreat with a mantra or a meditation practice or a process. But until the willingness, or this is my experience anyway, until the willingness to simply burn up in facing the self-betrayal, the self-violation, 
the self-hatred, the self-rape, the self-thievery. In facing that without moving to fix it or make it nice or make it comfortable or make it better or make it spiritual, just to burn up in it, to not move into denying it as if it's not there because all is one and all is God and all is perfect. Just to give up those uh, amulet statements and burn in it, grieve in it. There is the possibility of recognizing in the core, at the bottom, the purity is still pure. There has been no violation there, no experience to you or from you can violate that. Then you know directly, without doing anything, who you are. And since you don't do anything to realize who you are, it's causeless. Who you are and the recognition of who you are are both causeless. When we assign a cause to who we are, then we have a definition of who we are. And that definition is a story. And it has an image, and it has an emotion, and it has circumstances, and it's subject to change. It's subject to birth, it's subject to death. It's subject to betrayal, it's subject to thievery, it's subject to rape, it's subject to hatred. So, just so that it's very clear what is going on here, <laughs> is that I'm not interested at all in your having a better definition of who you are. I'm not interested in your having a better story of who you are, a place to escape to when things are rough or unhappy or boring. My interest in our meeting is that you will meet the truth of who you are and you will discover there is no escape from that. And in that surrender to what there is no escape from, you will meet the deeper, bigger truth of who you are and the still bigger, deeper truth. There is a point in this meeting where there is a critical shift where you don't relate to life as a series of definitions subject to change. You recognize the definitions, but you recognize that they are imposed onto life. That life is free of definition. Life itself the energy that infuses every life form. Life itself is free of definition. You are free of definition. You have defined yourself as somebody, good or bad or enlightened or unenlightened, or you got it or you didn't get it, or you kept it or you lost it. All this is absurd. Just definitions. The fear is to not define yourself at all. Because as this young woman spoke last night, she related that when she got close to not defining herself at all, she saw maybe she wouldn't exist then. That's the fear. It's a strong, deep fear. It's what all the conditioning is attached to. And it's true. If you stop defining yourself, you don't exist as any definition. 
You do exist, but not as any definition. You exist as who you are, indefinable, unconceivable, and undeniable. The question I, I have, and I, I've had such a profound experience that, that you're talking about, and I remember is, as I came out of the experience was with a thought, and the thought was, I want this. <laughs> and I immediately laughed at the futility and irony. Oh, that's of very that good. I, I so wisdom it, came with it. I that's it beautiful. Yes. Excellent. And, and then, and, I, and I've heard you talk so much about choices and devotion and intention. And when I ask myself the questions related to those things, everything comes up, yes, yes, yes. Yet I'm caught up in this betrayal of self in yeah, choice, so. choices that get made every day, um, shortcuts or temptations or attachments. Then there is something you don't get yet. Well, I'm wondering if, if I've created an illusion for myself yes. that, the, that the intention is there and the well, devotion is there. The and, intention and is there, but it's not 100%, because there's something that's being clung to, mm -hmm. desired. And that's then part of the sellout cycle, or the betrayal, self-betrayal cycle that you're talking about. But you can only continue a self-betrayal cycle if you feel like it's possible you're going to get something from it <clears throat> on one of these rounds. I mean, that's the incentive, right? Absolutely. So, so you have to see what it is you think you're going to get and tell the truth about that. Is that giving you what you really want, what you thought that getting that would really give you? So if it's money, then it's maybe it's security. You thought you'd get security, but you can never get enough money for security. I mean, <clears throat> if you don't have much money, you maybe don't mm -hmm. know that. But. <laughs> I've talked to enough people who have quite a lot of money. I mean, now they're like multimillionaires all over America. Are they any more secure? Well, definitely they're better fed and better clothed and better housed, and their children are going to good schools, and they feel very good about all that. And they have good health care, and that, they feel good about that, and that's all fine. But security? No. Hasn't been touched. Hasn't been touched. I think, I think a lot of it is, is fear. Yes, yes. definitely. Well, security yeah. is at its base, fear. So I just use yes. security. I don't know okay. if it's money. Yes. I said that because Seattle, everybody's getting rich in Seattle yeah. too. So <laughs> I said that. So it's like that. And at the base of it all is fear, all of it. Whether it's security, sex, or personal power, there's fear that's running it. So that's, this is, Great, so then what do you do about that? Hmm. What about this fear? Will it keep running the show or will you turn and face it? Will you self-inquire into this fear? Will you go to the very core of fear? I tell myself yes, and, and yet I know I come up short. But I tell okay, myself, Okay, yes. then you're telling the truth. Then that means you have another chance. You only have another chance if you're telling the truth. If you say, yes, yes I am, yes, yes, and you're lying, you have no chance yes. to actually investigate fear again. But if you're really telling the truth, I'm saying yes, but in fact, I'm not going all the way in it. Then this is the invitation back into fear. Are you, can you experience it now? Might as well do it here in front of everybody. <laughs> What's your worst fear? Let's verbalize it because that gives it, that's the practice. So let's bring the practice into satsang. Doing it wrong. 
And that was my fear of coming up here. And I, I raised my hand, and again, and Amber was a wonderful inspiration for me, because I raised my hand to overcome the fear, but it, to come okay. up here and be afraid of being with you and doing it wrong. Okay, so and if I, you I do it wrong, my though, life. what will that lead to? If you utterly fail, you really mess up. Really. And, Irrevocably. And <laughs> an opportunity to do it again. But what is it you, you feel about that? What's the story you tell yourself if you irrevocably, no opportunity to do it again, doomed? Were you raised Catholic? No. <laughs> 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 so well, what if you are doomed to hell, eternal hell? What does that mean? What's the, what's the fear of hell? Why is hell a place to fear and to avoid? I'm asking no, the fear no, in okay. the fear. That's, that's, that's good, and I just got it. It's, it's no love. No love. Yes. This is very clear, isn't it? Very clear. So what you, you are betraying yourself so that you are sh hope that you will get love, that you won't be left with no love, yes. because you might fail if you don't continue to betray yourself. Yes. But what you're recognizing is that in your continual self-betrayal, you are failing. Yes. Yes. yes, and to that degree you are suffering, and in the suffering you can't find the love. And you know this. So here, in this moment, you have an opportunity to actually experience the failure that has already happened. To really experience the hell of that. Because a self-betrayal is a separation from love. Can you feel that? Yes, I had a... When, when I told someone that I wanted to see you, but I was afraid to, and they said, why? And he says, I'm afraid it, I'll look at, at Gangaji and see myself. Uh -huh. And I'm afraid of, of that. And th the truth is, that it's, I mean, other people have, have set up here, I know. And it's something that has to be done to, to, to be experienced. But there's, there's certainly no, no fear. I know there's only love here. That's right. Yes. That's right. So thank you. So when there's not a physical Gangaji, to reflect that to you, I'll tell you where the reflection is. And that's in the core of meeting this failure. All the way in, there you will find the hand. There you will find yourself, unbetrayable, in love. Ah, thank, thank you. you and good luck. You. Let me know, okay? You write me a letter or something? Let me know. What's your name? Russ. Russ. Okay, good. That is the only failure, you know, this failure to love. Please. <laughs> failure to love. Because God is love, truth is love, consciousness is love, beingness is love. So failure to love is failure to be who you are. It means that you are practicing something else. You are practicing being something else, something you think you should be, or something your parents think you should be, or your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, or your husband, or your wife, or your enemy your friend. You just stop that and you are reunited with yourself.
what's the result then of, of allowing the addictions from the past to take precedence over the soul desire? A mess. A mess. That's right. That's the, the maturing that's necessary. Because if you haven't experienced this, you will. <laughs> but everyone in this room has. Everyone in this room has. You have experienced this. However it gets cloaked. However the physical addictions get shunted into something more acceptable. So not cigarettes, God forbid, you know, but there's some really good organic chocolate I know about. <laughs> <laughs> and in itself, there's absolutely nothing wrong with cigarettes, or organic chocolate, or sex, or alcohol, or drugs. There's nothing wrong with that, except when it takes precedence over your soul desire for itself. And the only thing that's wrong with that is that it's a mess. It's a mess and it covers the truth of the love that you are, that you hope the cigarette will give you a ex physical experience of, of, in a cigarette way, or that sex will in a sexual way, or that chocolate will in a chocolate way, or that some holy substance will in a holy substance way. But nothing can give you that but itself. And you are discovering, or you have discovered that. And the, when you say hypocrite, and how that hit you in the heart, that's the pain. That is divine pain. To recognize how the heart, how your own soul, has been betrayed time and time and time again. So that you go saying, I want true love or soul love or self-realization or God, and yet time and time again, we have all betrayed that, right? There's no one here that can say, oh, not me, <laughs> right? Because you have to tell the truth here, or otherwise that pain is covered, it's not felt. You're safely protected from that pain. But that pain is very important. That pain is your ally. It is not the enemy. If the mind co-ops it and makes it just another whip to beat you up with, it's the enemy. It's a superego. It's the mind. But the pain itself, the, uh, the recognition of the self-betrayal, is very important. So I would never teach you a technique to help you get rid of that pain. I know it to be your ally. I invite you to fully explore that, deeply explore that, leaving behind all stories about that, just to expo explore the horror the horror of this addiction to self-denial so that it can be met, so that it is no longer what you escape in substances or experiences or understanding even. You follow this? It's not too abstract? That's where it enters. There's a huge humbling that must occur, that is avoided. Because humbling, initially, is experienced as very painful. The kind of humiliation, humbling. It's just the initial experience that's on the periphery. If you are willing to experience that pain, 
the recognition of being the instrument of the self-betrayal, taking responsibility for the whole self-betrayal of every human being, even. It's all located in you. To actually meet that, to not spiritualize the escape, to meet it, to experience it all the way, then that pain is not painful. It is such a divine fire. And it burns up any possibility of ever again believing that, well, I can do what I want, because I am everything or nothing, depending on which group I'm speaking to. <laughs> so there is a, a cut, a shift or a burning. It reveals the power of this choice, this choice of self-betrayal or self-denial to be the power of suffering to be the mess. So the way to recognize what is untouched by the mess is to go directly into the mess. So I'm happy you had this pain arise. It's the Satguru's arrow. There are many who have learned tricks to avoid this pain, to avoid the error, dodging. The mind is very facile in its dodging. Not me, not me. No, 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 that really wasn't self-betrayal. No, no, I was just da, 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 da. Very sophisticated justifications and explanations, stories. But the willingness to be shot clean through with this arrow. This is the willingness to be free. So that whatever appears in change of scene, and this scene will change, everybody knows that. The state of mind that you experience here, as blessed and holy as it is, will change because it had a beginning. It has a middle, it has an end. So whenever you meet change, which you must meet, you have the opportunity to respond in a way that is true, and you have the opportunity to respond in a way that is a self-betrayal or a self-denial. Then you have the opportunity to lie about the self-betrayal or even to lie about the truth. In other words, then you have the opportunity to suffer as well as having the opportunity to tell the truth about the truth and about the self-betrayal. And that gives up your choice of suffering. And there's the addiction. That's what the planet is infected with, this addiction of suffering. Not pain. There's nothing wrong with pain. Pain is clean and pure. But suffering has to do with lying, dodging, avoiding, justifying, explaining understanding, numbing, acquiring, losing, getting. And in this business you are absolutely on your own. In that moment there is no teacher, there is no teaching, there is no God, there is no devil, there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no enlightenment, there's no unenlightenment. 
is simply a matter of telling the truth. You can get away with it if you lie. There's nobody who will say, gotcha. I mean, they will be, but they're probably doing their whole thing too. <laughs> this is the beauty of this Leela. This is where you are absolutely alone. All the support has been to that moment. And teachers are fooled all the time anyway. Because teachers believe those who are trustworthy and they believe those who are not trustworthy. You don't want to waste your time not believing somebody, right? You understand what I'm saying? You can't count on somebody, well, you'll let me know if I'm off. No, you are the only one who can really finally know. There are lots of great acts in the world, but you know. And this is a rare and precious moment. This moment before the choice of suffering is taken up again. So then we get to the really the deeper issue, which is what you call resistance to me, a teacher, a guru. It's not resistance to me. It's resistance to yourself. It's a fear of giving up the self-doubt. Because that self-doubt has been a companion, a tyrant of a companion, but nevertheless it's kept you in line. It's kept you from being too arrogant. It's kept you from being not a megalomaniac, which you have seen. You've seen megalomaniacs. We have them in history. We have them in our lives. And there's a fear of that because there's also a recognition of the talent for that or the affinity for that. This is all part of the human makeup, the human aggression. So the self-doubt or the superego, we're very afraid of giving up its, its power. But it must be given up. That's a leap. There must be a willingness to stop resisting yourself, however that forms in whatever formula, and it's infinite. There must be a willingness to, to give up the self-doubt so that if there is arrogance, a megalomania, a delusion there, it can be seen. If there is self-hatred there, it can be seen. If there's hatred for your fellow companions, it can be seen. With self-doubt, it's you that is basically wrong. Of course, you know, you see those who are more wrong all the time. <laughs> but at the core of it, it is you that is wrong. So this is a huge challenge. And I'm not saying that arrogance and megalomania won't appear. I would expect it if I were you. If it's being hidden, it will appear. It's only then that it can be seen. If it is seen, it is seen for the suffering that it is, for the absurdity that it is, and it's not followed. If it's not seen, it's followed unconsciously, subconsciously. So then we have this uh, duo or duet between self-doubt and arrogance, ego and superego. And deeper than that, closer than that, is the truth.
At one time, this, this teaching, which is really present in all religions, was kept very, very secret until you had proved yourself not a megalomaniac, <laughs> a level of maturity. And I know that's true in the Tibetan Dzogchen teachings that you, it's only recently that they've even been spoken of, nobody even knew about them. And it's true of Christian mystics, and, you know, St. John of the Cross spent many years in a prison cell. This are, these are unusual times. This is a dangerous teaching. It is a dangerous invitation. These are dangerous times. And somehow, you are here. Maybe thinking the danger is too big, or thinking you're not ready. But whatever you are thinking, that is ego or superego. The truth is closer than that. And the invitation is to recognize yourself as the truth. By that, recognizing all the lies as they appear the temptations as they appear, the elaborate explanations and justifications for the temptations as they appear, with now the capacity to choose the truth. There is such space when the attention that has been knotted around Seeking the truth and resisting the truth is cut. I'm having a problem with uh, trust. Uh huh. And um, trusting what? I uh, all of the um. Oh, the beings that come to my life uh, and in some way disappoint me uh -huh. in what I think they should have been or oh, wound well, up. That's great. <laughs> that's great. So then you can distrust your thoughts. Perhaps your thoughts of what you think they should be or what's ultimately distrustful. Okay. okay. <laughs> Then you don't have to do it one by one. You know? <laughs> First my mother, then my father, then God, then my husband, then my daughter, then my lover. Just, oh, my thought of what they should be. Because I can guarantee you that's distrustful. That's based on some past concept of what needs to be for you to be. But here you are, regardless of all those failed expectations. So am I supposed to wind up trusting or just give that up? What it's, do you mean? I have no well, idea what you're even talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean it, though. <laughs> yeah, so right now, if you give up any thought of what anything should be, you stop trusting any thought that you have of what anything should be, yes, give that up. Give the trust in your thoughts up. Just right now, as an experiment. But what about the trust? No, right now, oh. as an experiment. <laughs> okay, I'll just go to sleep. Really? <laughs> go to sleep then. Are you asleep? No. <laughs> So you were putting your trust in a thought, a trust, well, if I do that, then I will go to sleep. <laughs> I have no idea what will happen. Well, that's great. That's the beginning. So in that, there's a little opening. I have no idea what will happen. Excellent. 
then you can see the habit of the ideas of what will happen or should happen or did happen. Don't trust those, just as an experiment, not as a religion, not as a liturgy, just as an experiment, as an investigation, just right now, stop trusting your thoughts. Just to, to, why not? <laughs> Haven't they failed you over and over and over? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, you see, this is telling the truth then. Well, I'm, then I'm utterly, I'm just clueless. Good. <laughs> clueless. Then that's, our, that's a place of innocence. That's a place of innocence. I'm a little f afraid. Yes, I understand. Often with innocence, if innocence has not been met, fear arises because innocent has, innocence has been abused in the past. Definitely, that's also part of the experience on this planet. But right here, for this moment, you give yourself one second, one second, to be absolutely, completely clueless. To not know. And then tell the truth about the space of that. <laughs> it's, it, it's empty. What's empty? The space. And you? Where are you? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> No, I could say I'm not here or I don't exist, but no, that's not true. But you do true. exist. Obviously you exist. Yeah. Your consciousness, how could you not exist? <laughs> what? <laughs> I want to trust somebody or something or I want that. Uh-huh. What will that give you if you get that? Peace. Uh-huh. Then, then it'll be something Where's stable. Where's peace now? To rely on. Where's peace? Somebody has it and they'll give it to you if you just pay them some trust? Y yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the absurdity of this. Just stop right now. Just take a moment and experience the peace that is already here. The unconditional peace that has nothing to do with anybody else, has nothing to do with any circumstance. That's your betrayal. It's your betrayal of that, that you then have to see betrayal everywhere else. It's your lack of trust for that peace that's already here within you. Yes. So you should be bowing down to all the people who have proven that they are untrustworthy in giving you that peace. No one can give it to you. Impossible. Because it's already here. The only one who has the power to take it away from you is yourself. And you have that power. That's part of the play. You have that mind power. Can I stop? <laughs> yes, that's a very good question. What's the answer? Tell the truth. No. It's the truth today. The truth or today is this you, moment. You cannot I, stop tomorrow, this betrayal. When I leave. Tonight. No, right now you tell the truth. Can you stop this betrayal? Right now? Yes. Yes. It's very simple. I am always only speaking of right now. That's the only time stopping can happen. It has nothing to do with the future, nothing to do with the past. Right now, am I willing to stop this betrayal? Right now. The moment you get into, yes, but I won't, yes, but I didn't, this is the betrayal. The betrayal happens in this moment only. 
And you just said, how simple, yes, I can. Yes. That's all you have is this moment. Okay. And then the truth is obvious. And the lie is obvious and the addiction to the betrayal, if it's not obvious, will be very obvious. And with that addiction to the betrayal is the addiction to giving my trust to other and then being betrayed by that other. This is all part of the package. My teacher, my friend, my blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yes. So the good news is that you're sick of it. Because it is sickening. <laughs> it's sickening, yes. Yes. So you stop eating what is sickening and you aren't sick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so is there defeat in that okay? Or no. Is there... No. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Well, you let me know, okay? Okay. I want to know. All right, I will. Thank you. There comes some uh, time where there's not a, not a belief, not a belief that you can be trusted. You recognize how you have sabotaged your own peace, your own enlightenment, your own awakening, your own love. You recognize that that has been sabotaged by you once you, you stop projecting it out on everybody else. And there's this fear that you are essentially untrustworthy. And the truth is, who you think you are is essentially untrustworthy. But the, the peace itself, this is absolutely trustworthy. The spaciousness that is consciousness is absolutely, completely trustworthy. Thoughts of who you are and feelings of who you are and conclusions of who you are appear and change and disappear. That's the law of this planet. They are eaten by other thoughts just as they eat the previous thoughts and feelings and states. You are changeless peace. So to trust yourself is not to trust your image of yourself or your thought of yourself is to trust the truth of yourself, which cannot be thought. And so now if you're thinking yourself as peace, drop that thought. That's not peace. That's a thought of peace. So it's this before beginningness, this immediacy that is right here, always right here, right now, never in the past, and never in the future. I appreciate the weariness that you bring to this question. But the peace is not weary. It's the identification with yourself as an image, or a thought, or a sensation, or a feeling. It's exhausting at a certain point. First it's entertaining, it's powerful, it feels great. That's when you're two, three, four, five, and six. <laughs> By the time you hit puberty, it's like, whoa! <laughs> Still great, though. And I don't even mean this chronologically. I mean it kind of in the, the age of the soul, let us say. And then there's a time where there's an exhaustion. And that in itself is the call home. You needn't continue the pretense unless you like to continue the pretense. If you like to stop, stop. And tell the truth about what is already here. 
if you're trying to fix an image of yourself so that you get here or you get to peace, just stop, just for a moment, just for one second. And then you have to tell the truth. If you are expecting lights and adrenaline and ecstasy, stop. Just stop that expectation that's based on something. Just be still with nothing happening. When we are babies, we naturally receive what is to be given. That's just the way that the infant is formed, unless there's some dysfunction. We receive the nourishment, it has to be for the organism to grow. So it's a natural event, this uh, capacity to receive. And then as we grow, as, we, as our minds develop, there slowly but surely comes the revelation or the intelligence, the wisdom, that some things, if you receive, do harm, either to the body, receiving foods that are tainted or poison, or to the emotions receiving a parent's or a brother or a sister's lack of love, judgment, and of course to the mind, receiving uh, indoctrination that teaches hate and brainwashing, cultural brainwashing, familial brainwashing. So this is uh, essential, this recognition that it is not useful to receive everything that is offered. And from that, a discriminating wisdom is uh, born and developed. In the world we live in, most of what is offered is not useful to receive. And in recognizing that, there is a, usually a shutting down of actually the capacity to receive. Since we recognized in our parents, first of all, recognizing that they weren't God, they were more like the devil sometimes, and certainly ignorant sometimes, this is a huge disillusionment regarding one's capacity to open and simply receive and trust. And one's friends, as you grow up, you know friends can betray, friends can lie to you, and you know that you lie, can lie to your friends and betray your friends. And husbands and wives, and governments, certainly, and gurus, certainly, teachers of all kind, your own thoughts, you know, can deceive you, aren't trustworthy, can torture you. If you receive your own thoughts, you can be whipped and beat. Your own emotions, you know, can get out of control. Your body, uh, your body can't be trustworthy. It stumbles and falls. It gets sick for no good reason. It ages and dies. So there's this constant uh, lesson to not trust, not open. It's dangerous. It hurts. And in that, then, there is a, a 
kind of hyper vigilance of the mind to collect information, to collect enough data, to collect enough so that you can, if there is ever a time when you can open, you will know when that time is to be. And the activity becomes collecting. And in this collecting, you discover over and over again. You collect so much, you collect so much, and then there's a little more to collect, and then well, there's still more over there to collect. So you go to teacher after teacher, or training after training, or book after book after book after book, tapes, videos, collecting, collecting, collecting. Because there's also throughout it all this profound yearning just to be open. And it's usually thought of or phrased to return, to return home or to return to the innocence of the child, to be like a child, to enter heaven. But your mind is not a child's mind. Your mind has seen some very rough things. Your body has experienced some very rough things. Your emotions are rough, often. So when <clears throat> last night I was speaking of opening to the silence that is here, the silence in your own heart, the silence in the lake, the silence in the rain, and finally the silence that everything is. It's a matter of receiving, simply receiving. It's no simple matter because of the complication of the fear of simply receiving, simply opening. Many of you live in cities and places where it would be quite dangerous to, to be simply receiving. And so there's a, a recognition of that, and the, the capacity to simply receiving gets covered by the years of conditioning to selectively receiving, based on the information or the data that's been accumulated. So maybe in a moment of grace, you open to your wife or your husband or your child or your lover or in nature or your teacher. But you very quickly close because you understand that danger has always followed opening. I'm not suggesting that you try to open or that you try to forget about the future or that you try to receive. That won't work, that it will just build another. That's another piece of information <clears throat> that will go into the data bank that will create a, a struggle. But I am suggesting that you observe when you are open and when you are closed. When you are simply open to receive and when you are simply rejecting, and to inquire into that, not as a means of gathering more information, but as a, a path to discovery of what it is that is endangered, and is it really endangered right now. So we're dealing with the circuitry of the nervous system. And it may not even be conscious. It could be just part of the programs that are operating. But the power of inquiry is like shining a light in the basement. There's a creaky old furnace that's, furnace that's spewing gases all through the house that you never even knew about. You actually open the door and shine the light in there. It's, oh my God. 
No wonder I'm sick in body and mind and spirit. And in that recognition, the natural course, without even thinking, is to turn the furnace off. And that happens from your own intelligence, not from anything I will say to you. All that I'm here for is to point to this openness, this capacity, this endless capacity to receive. And in that endless capacity to receive the recognition that who you are has never been damaged by anything you have received. Your body has certainly been damaged. Your mind may have been damaged. Your emotions may have been damaged. But who you are, the truth of who you are, is free of damage. So our dialogues in here, our conversations in here, are all geared to that, to the recognition that opening your mind to the silence that is the source of your mind is opening to yourself. The silence is already open. Your self is already open. It is your mind that has the opportunity to stop gathering the information, to stop imagining the future, to stop strategizing for survival in the future, to simply be held by its source. It's not my aim that when you leave here you walk down the streets of New York City open with no future, but that you recognize the capacity, the openness is always here and that what is not open can be used intelligently. You can look both ways. You can listen. And you can recognize at any moment, at every moment, who you are. Then the body is tended naturally. Of course, you don't eat poison food. Of course, you tend to the diseases of the body. But it's not about who you are. And it's not that people won't betray you. It's not that your heart won't break again and again and again. It's a heartbreaking business. But in the recognition that your heart breaking only reveals deeper who you are, then yes, you let the heart break. It's not that your thoughts won't betray you. Thoughts will say yes or no. And usually following each other, yes, no. <laughs> so there's either a betrayal in the yes or a betrayal in the no. So to recognize that is then to recognize what cannot be betrayed. what is free, what is true, who you are. 